Hello all, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a project update video for this 1-6 scale Dragon M4A3 Sherman tank. Since the last video update, a lot of progress has been made to the model and the model in this video here is approximately 90% completed. We'll be going over the additions made to the tank in this video. The most noticeable change since the last video update is that the tank is now painted. Just prior to adding on the base coat of olive drab, just like with the rest of my 1.6 scale builds, the entire vehicle was first primed in primer gray, and then the base coat was then added. In addition to the base coat of olive drab, the model's markings have also been added. Just like with the other 1-6 scale tank builds that you see on my video listings or on the eastcoastarmory.com website, the markings that you see on the vehicle are applied on via paint and are stenciled on. As we recall from the models unboxing video, the basic Dragon Kit does supply you with a small little set of decals. The decals consist of several stars and I also believe it included the US uh, Army ID lettering. Now, like I also mentioned in my other Dragon model videos. Uh, when it comes to decals on these 1-6 scale tanks, I never opt for using the decal in that, from my personal experience, the larger the decal, the more difficulty I have in applying the decal to the model. Decals, for me, work better on smaller scale models. However, on models of this scale, they be, for me, they're a little bit problematic. Like I frequently mention in my videos, for the markings on all of my 1-6 scale tanks, I like to apply them via paint with stencils. This here is a spare stencil I have from the project. The stencils themselves are made out of sticker paper. I make them on my computer and I cut them out for the installation. Once the stencil is applied to the vehicle, the color for the marking gets applied via an airbrush. Once done, the stencil gets removed. By the time the stencil applies all the markings for the vehicle, the stencil doesn't really hold up and gets destroyed. The one advantage that stenciling has over decals in that, one, the now that the marking is applied on with paint, it's a lot more durable than that of a fragile decal. You don't have to worry about sealing the marking and you also don't have to worry about the marking ever flaking off on you as the model ages. Also the markings applied on with the stencil is adds a, a realistic touch to the model in that the markings on the real vehicles were applied via stencils in pretty much the same manner. All of the markings that you see on the model were applied via stencils. This would include the stars on the turret the star on the transmission cover, the T, O, and E markings on both the front and rear portion of the vehicle. Another marking that's added on with the stencil is that of the USA serial number, which is always found on the rear portions of the vehicle. As a quick note, if we notice that the on all American tanks from World War II, the prefix of the serial number we'll start off with a 30. The 30 prefix signifies that the vehicle is that of a tank and not any other type of vehicle. If the model was a tank destroyer or a self-propelled gun the prefix would be different and would be set accordingly depending on whichever vehicle it is. The only marking on this model that was not applied via stencils was that of the vehicle's name. As you can see, the vehicle has been given the name Q-Ball. Now, the name that you see here and the logo are purely fictional and are not based on a real M4 Sherman tank. The name of the model was suggested by the client to which the tank will be going to. As for the logo itself, the name as well as the rest of the logo were all applied to the vehicle via paintbrush and was painted on by hand. The logo is a mirror image on the reverse side of the model. In addition to all of the markings being added, as well as the paint, the model has been completely weathered. If I rotate the vehicle, you'll see that the model's weathering has been added to all sides of the vehicle, including the top and lower hull.
Moving our way to the rear portion of the vehicle, you can see that the exhaust soot weathering has been added to the model. The exhaust weathering was added to both sides of the grill, which are which is directly in front of the goosenecking exhaust, which are behind the armor plate. Also, where to add the exhaust is that of the Little Joe Auxiliary Generator exhaust pipe, which is in this location over here. Once the rest of the paintwork was completed, it was then time to work on the paintwork for the lower suspension. If we notice, the rubber tires on the road wheels have all been painted as well as weathered. In addition to the rubber tires being painted, the all of the tank's Zerk fittings have been completed and painted in red at this time. As we recall on all AFV, both present and past, Zerk fittings are typically found highlighted in red paint. Moving our way to the return rollers and rear either wheel, if we notice, steel weathering has been added to these components here. On the real Sherman tank, these components are made out of steel and are not rubber rimmed. A common mistake found on lots of Sherman tank models, either made by companies or by individuals, is that a lot of people assume that these, rub that these tires here are rubber rimmed since the main road wheels have rubber tires on them. That is actually false. On the tanks fitted with the VVSS suspension, these two components here are purely steel rimmed and do not have any rubber linings on them. The only Shermans that do have rubber linings on these two components here are tanks equipped with the HVSS suspension. As for the type of weathering that you see here, this is all applied via dry brushing. And keep in mind on the real tank, the track is constantly rubbing against these two components here, which will lead to the either wheel and return roller having this type of an appearance. The same type of weathering has also been applied to the top portions here of the skid rail. Currently, the way you see the suspension, it is complete and is awaiting the installation of the tank's track. Moving up from the suspension takes us to the taillights. The taillights on both the left and right side of the vehicle have their clear resin lenses now fixed. The lenses themselves have been painted. On all American World War II AFV, they follow the same format. The top lens itself on the left hand side is red, while the bottom lens is would be silver. It's almost identical on the reverse side. However, on the right hand side, rather than the lens being red, the lens is blacked out and is has been painted with black. However, the silver lens is still painted the same way. Moving our way to the filler caps, the this is another portion of the vehicle that has been completed. All of the fuel caps have their chain retained pins attached. In addition to the chain retained pins, like on all of my 1-6 scale tank models, the fuel caps open up, revealing turned aluminum fluid filler caps on the inside. This bit of detailing is true for just about all of the fuel filler caps on this vehicle. Just like with the real vehicle, the caps are closed and are held in place via the chain retained pins. Moving up from the filler caps leads us to the fire extinguisher box. Just like in my other videos, I mentioned the fire extinguisher box itself has two red handles. The handles have been painted red and would be present on like this on the real Sherman tank. Moving our way to the front of the vehicle, pretty much the entire front portion of the model is now completed. Starting with first the headlight. Both of the bow headlights have their lenses attached. The only thing that needs to be added to the headlight to complete it further is that of the chain retained plunger, which goes into these little canisters over here. Also fixed to the model at this time is that of the bow M1919 machine gun. Like I mentioned in earlier, the kit 1919 was replaced the ECA M43 
machine gun well was added. And for the barrel and ball, the set from Panzerworks has been used. Also, like I mentioned previously, the machine gun is pivotal, just like it is on the real vehicle. Moving up from the front glass plate brings us to the tank side view mirrors. One common bit of detailing that is virtually forgotten about on Sherman tanks is that the tanks were actually designed to have side view mirrors mounted to the glass, front glasses plate of the vehicle. The purpose of these side view mirrors is purely for transport and highway use. As the mirrors themselves are far too fragile to enter combat with. Typically when a tank were enter combat, the side view mirrors would be stowed inside of the vehicle. As for the side view mirrors themselves, they follow the same format as they do on the rest of my Sherman tanks in this scale, in that they have a real mirror insert that gets added to the mirror pan. This same exact design is a mirror image on the opposite side of the tank. Also completed on the model at this time is the interior paintwork on all of the tank's hatches. Starting here with the assistant driver's hatch, all of the weathering has been applied, as well as the addition of the Panzerworks Resin USAFV Periscope insert. Like I mentioned on my other builds, the Periscope from Panzerwerk is a very nice piece. And once added, is a great addition to the model. The driver's hatch on the reverse side is a mirror image of what you see here. Moving our way to the top part of the turret, like I mentioned with the bow, all of the hatches have also been completed with all their paintwork. This includes both on the copula as well as on the loader's oval hatch. On the loader's hatch, the interior portion of the headrest pad has been painted and weathered along with the rest of the hatch. Hatch is still fully functional and opens and closes as well as it did before the tank was painted. The same kind of weathering was also added to the tank's commander's copula. With the weathering added to both the headrest that's found on the hatch as well as on the perimeter of the copula interior itself. Just like with the bow hatches, the commander's copula also features a Panzerwerk USAFV resin periscope. Moving our way to the front portion of the turret leads us to the coaxial M1919 machine gun. The 1919 that you see here is actually the kit original. The kit does supply you with a somewhat decent M1919 for the coaxial gun. The kit version could use a few improvements. The two improvements that I made to the kit gun was that I drilled out the cooling shroud on the 1919. The DML one does have them molded in, however they are very lightly molded into the surface and are only on the barrel sides and not the top and bottom due to the way the barrel was molded. But more importantly, another addition that, or modification that had to have been made to the barrel was I had to actually shorten the barrel approximately half an inch. If you install the barrel as per the kit, the gun will protrude from the mandlet and approximately out to here, which is incorrect for the Sherman as the way the mounts are set up on the rotor, only the nose of the machine gun protrudes from the mantlet, like you see here. By simply shortening the barrel, the barrel just gets inserted into the stock mount and was a very simple addition that was made. Currently, the last of the tank's details are being assembled, painted, and weathered. Once the last of those components are affixed to the model, the vehicle is complete. And with that, that concludes this project update video. 
for this one six scale Dragon M4 A3 Sherman tank. If you like this video, stop by and like us on Facebook. And don't forget to check out EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 scale tank builds as well as other 1.6 scale detail components. Thank you.